All right. So if you remember the last things that we have discussed in our previous session, it was the diuretics. And if you remember, we discussed three different types of diuretics. First one is going to be the osmotic diuretics. And if you remember, osmotic diuretics are as the glucose in diabetic patients. If you remember, if a person has diabetes, he would have high blood glucose levels. And remember, glucose is not a macromolecule. It's not a plasma protein. It's not a blood cell. So it gets filtered. Remember, 100% of the filtrated glucose gets reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules. All of the glucose that you're going to get released out in the filtrate gets reabsorbed normally through those tubular cells of the proximal convoluted tubules back to your blood. What happens if I am releasing large amounts of glucose into my kidney tubules beyond the ability of the kidney tubules to reabsorb? The glucose is going to remain in my kidney tubules and will be pulling water out with it. It acts as a, an osmotic diuretic. So here, the glucose is creating an osmotic force to pull the water out in the kidney tubules and get this water released in the urine. We stated two other types of diuretics. First one was the ADH inhibitors. ADH inhibitors are like alcohol. Remember, ADH function is to enhance the water reabsorption by promoting the formation of aquaparine channels in the collecting ducts of my kidney tubules. So normally, ADH will be, if present, will be enhancing the tubular cells of the collecting ducts to form aquaparine channels, which will allow the water to move back from the kidney tubules into my blood vessels. So alcohol here is going to be inhibiting the release of ADH. And so I won't have those aquaporine channels to enhance the water return to my vessels. So this water, instead of being reabsorbed back to my vessels, it gets released out in the urine. That's why we're going to consider alcohol here as a diuretic. A third type of diuretics that we've seen last time was the diuretics that act by inhibiting the sodium reabsorption. Like caffeine. Caffeine inhibits the sodium reabsorption. And if you remember, normally, 60% of the sodium going to get reabsorbed just in the proximal convoluted tubules. This is a mandatory reabsorption that takes place. And I've got sodium reabsorption under the effect of the aldosterone, which takes place here in my distal 
convoluted tubules. So if I inhibited the sodium reabsorption, this sodium is gonna be moving out in the urine and it's gonna be pulling water with it. It's gonna be followed by water. As I release water out in the urine, this is gonna be a diuretic. So again, again, three different types of diuretics that we've seen in last class. First one was the osmotic diuretics. Second one where was the ADH inhibitors. And the third one was the substance that inhibit the sodium reabsorption. Moving on to a new topic today is gonna to be the renal clearance. Renal clearance is the volume of the plasma that gets cleared from a particular substance in a given time. So for example, if I want to check how good is my kidney working, what I will do, I will simply check the concentration of a specific substance in the blood. So let's say on here, in the blood, go into the kidney, I have X amount of a substance called inulin. And please make sure that you are able to differentiate between inulin and insulin. Inulin is a substance that we don't have normally in the body, and it's gonna be 100% filtered and will not be reabsorbed. So why do we use inulin? Because simply it doesn't enter in the metabolic activities of the cells. So you can, your cells will not consume any of it. And all of the inulin gonna get released out by filtration and none of it gonna be reabsorbed. So inulin is gonna be the best substance for us to know how good the kidney is actually filtering the, the blood. So I injected X amount of inulin in my patient and I will be collecting here the inulin that comes out in the urine. So I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm checking how long did it take the kidney to get rid of this amount of inulin. Once I'm done, I will check, yeah, so I take, let's say one day to get rid of this amount of inulin in the urine. Why do you think would I need to use renal clearance? Why would I need to do this? Why would I inject a substance in a person and I would be collecting this substance out in the urine. What do you think? This gives me an idea about what? What do you think? It gives me an idea about how good am I filtering the blood. So again, again, why do I use renal clearance? To check GFR, to check how good is the glomerular filtration is taking place. So what if I checked renal clearance for a person who has a kidney disease and I find out that he takes longer than usual to get rid of the inulin. So let's say normally a person would clear this amount of inulin in 12 hours and he takes one day. This means what for me in terms of how good is the kidney filtering the blood? Is this disease affecting his kidney is interfering with a normal filtration? What do you think? If it takes him longer to filter the blood, 
if it takes longer, this means that the kidney is not functioning well, right? So this is the first concept. Why would I need to perform renal clearance to check how good is the filtration taking place in the kidney? Another thing is also to follow up the progress of the renal disease. So if, for example, this patient, I figured out that he has a kidney problem, uh, let's say nephritic syndrome, and I decided to put him on cortisol, corticosteroids. And I told him, we're gonna follow up after you have a follow up after two weeks from today. He came after two weeks and I did perform another renal clearance test and now it's taken him two days to clear the inlet. Is this medication working or not? What do you think? No. I should be looking at something else. I should be uh, trying to find a different dose. And because the patient is getting worse, the disease is progressing. So renal clearance is also going to give you the ability to follow the progress of a renal disease. Also to follow how good is the, is the patient responding to the medication that you give. All right. Moving on to our next organ that shares in the formation of the urinary system. We discussed first the kidneys. Now we're discussing this muscular tube that will be conducting the urine down from the kidney to the urinary bladder. Those are the ureters. Ureters will be transporting the urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. They are traveling retroperitoneum, if you remember, kidneys, ureters, and the major blood vessels like the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta. All of those are retroperitoneal. They are located outside of the peritoneal cavity. They are located in the space behind the peritoneal cavity. They are still abdominal organs, but they are retroperitoneal. The ureters will be joining the urinary bladder from its through its posterior wall. Through its posterior wall. So why do you think would I be joining the urinary bladder through the posterior wall and not through the superior surface like here? So if we're looking closer to the junction between the urinary bladder and the ureter, the urinary bladder, when it contracts, it contracts in this way. So the muscle is going to be contracting this way. So what happens actually to the lower end of the ureter, it's going to be kinked. And this will be blocking the back flow of the urine up towards the kidney. So when I contract the urinary bladder, the urine is supposed to move from the urinary bladder down to the urethra, not up back to the ureter and to the kidney. So when the muscles of the urinary bladder contract to, to allow the release of the urine through the, ure, through the urethra, those muscles are going to be kinking the lower end of the ureter, preventing any backflow of the urine towards the skin.
a real, a rare congenital disease where I've got the direct connection of the ureter to the superior surface like this. What's this patient gonna have as a problem later on in life? What do you think? Incontinence, incontinence here means I'm not able to close this. I'm prevent, I'm not able to prevent the urine from being released to the outside. All right, this is incontinence. But what's gonna happen if I have a direct connection, I have a congenital problem, the ureter is connected to the superior surface, not the posterior wall of the urinary bladder, like what is normal. What's gonna happen if I have backflow of the urine towards the kidney? What happens? Infections, yes, recurrent infections because of the stasis, UTIs. Also, this patient might develop hydronephrosis. Let me pull up here how the kidneys might look like. See? I'm accumulating urine in those small canals to the extent that the minor calluses, major calluses are becoming dilated to, and they start to compress the normal kidney tissue. All right, so if I have backflow of the urine, this might cause hydronephrosis, like what you see on here. What you see on here. A huge dilation of the calluses causing the compression of the kidney tissue. And of course, this is gonna result in degeneration of the kidney tissue and may, resulting in renal failure. One risk factor for developing infections, kidney stones, and if it was something chronic, it might also cause hydronephrosis, is not going to the restroom as often as person should. So if I kept holding the urine, this urine will be accumulated in the in the ureter and will cause the dilation of those minor calluses, major calluses that we have discussed. Yeah, the same exact concept, vesical urethral reflux. Yeah, this might cause here, this congenital anomaly might result in this reflux. Yes, definitely. All right, the muscles, here I see a question, the muscles don't contract as well using urine to backflow. So here, if, if, if the ureter is joining the superior surface, even when the muscles are contracting, they will not be kinking the end of the ureter acting as a valve. So this won't be, effective, the so muscle contraction won't be effective to prevent the backflow of the urine into the ureter. Is this clear? Questions, questions?
questions? All right, so again, again, why is the ureter will be joining the posterior wall of the urinary bladder? Because simply, I need this to kink the distal ends of the ureters to close them. And this will allow me to prevent the backflow of the urine. Moving on to the urinary bladder, which is a muscular sac that is responsible for temporary storage of the urine. Again, it's located retroperitoneal, outside of the peritoneal cavity. It's gonna be located in the, in the pelvis, on the pelvic floor, directly posterior to the pubic symphysis. If you remember, the bone that will be located anterior, if you remember how the coxal bone did look like. I did have three fused bones forming together my coxal bone. Those were the ileum, ischium, and pubis. If you remember, this was the pubic bone or the pubis. The two pubic bones are attached together by a joint. We call this joint is my symphysis pubis or my pubic symphysis. So the urinary bladder is gonna be located posterior to the pubic symphysis or the symphysis pubis. And this is why it's gonna be at a higher risk of being injured in case of a car accident or a pelvic fracture. The urinary bladder neck is gonna be surrounded in males by a gland. This is the prostate gland. In males also is gonna be located just anterior to the straight part of the colon. This is gonna be the rectum. That's why if a person is suffering from urgency and incomplete voiding of the urinary bladder, those are manifestations of benign prosthetic hyperplasia or BPH. An enlargement in the prostate gland might be causing those urinary symptoms. So one of the examinations that we can perform in order to check if a, this person has an enlargement of the prostate gland or not is by performing a rectal exam. So we're gonna be going to the inside of the rectum and we're gonna be performing a forward push to check the consistency and the size of the prostate gland. In females, the urinary bladder is gonna be located anterior to the vagina and to the uterus. which is going to be located anterior to the rectum and anal canal and anus. So anterior here to the urinary bladder, we've got the symphysis pubis. And this position of the urinary bladder explains why during pregnancy, pregnant women are gonna have frequency and they will go more often to the restroom. They might also be dribbling urine 
Why? Because of the compression that is applied by the enlarged uterus during pregnancy. Questions, questions? All right, so looking closer here at the different parts of the urinary bladder, what we can see here on top of the urinary bladder is this membrane. This is a peritoneum. If you remember, the urinary bladder is located the retroperitoneum. The wall of the urinary bladder is going to contain a muscle. This is called the detrusor muscle, detrusor muscle. On the inside, we're going to have those elevations in the mucosal lining of the urinary bladder. Those are called the rugae. If you can see on here, those are the ureters. And we can see here on the posterior wall of the urinary bladder, the openings of the ureters. Those are my ureteric orifices. We've got the funnel shaped part of the urinary bladder is gonna be conducting the urine towards the urethra. We call this is the trigone as it looks like a triangle. This will be conducting the urine down through the urethra. And if you can see on here, the urethra is going to be surrounded by an internal urethral sphincter. And to the outside, we've got the external urethral sphincter. So we've got two urethral sphincters on here. One on the inside, one on the outside. The one on the inside is going to be the internal urethral sphincter. The one on the outside is going to be my external urethral sphincter. External urethral sphincter, as you see on here, it's part of the urogenital diaphragm, which is the set of muscles that will form the floor of the pelvis. This is a five stars diagram for our upcoming lab exam. Five stars diagram for the upcoming lab exam. All the markings, all the markings on the diagram are highly important. So why do you have those ones on here encircled? Because simply those are the three muscles that will play a role in micturation as we're gonna see in a second. So moving on to the urethra, the urethra is gonna be the muscular tubes that will be conducting the urine from the urinary bladder to the outside through the external urethral orifice. It's gonna have two sphincters, internal urethral sphincters this is gonna be in under involuntary control because it's going to be a formed of smooth muscles like the urinary bladder itself and the external urethral sphincters is going to be under voluntary control it's going to be formed of skeletal muscles surrounding the urethra so we've got again two sphincters around the urethra We've got in, 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 internal is in, 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 voluntary. So involuntary is going to be formed by smooth muscles. Compared to the external one is going to be under voluntary control is going to be skeletal muscles. The urethra is much shorter in females than it is in males. It's about three to four centimeters in length in females. The 
external urethral orifice, which is the opening of the urethra, is located anterior to the vaginal opening, as we see on here. This is the vagina, and this is going to be the external urethral orifice, and it's going to be located posterior to the clitoris, which is the erectile tissue that corresponds to the male penis. So anterior to the external urethral orifice, we've got this erectile tissue called the clitoris. In males, the urethra is going to be much longer and it serves as a common pathway for both urine and semen. The urethra in males is going to be divided into three main parts. Part that will be surrounded by the prostate gland, we call this the prostatic urethra. Part that will be located between the prostate gland and the penis, this is going to be the membranous urethra or intermediate urethra. And the third part that will be traveling through the penis, this is going to be the spongy urethra or penile urethra. So if we're drawing on here, this is going to be the urinary bladder surrounding the neck of the urinary bladder. As we've mentioned earlier, it's, we're going to have the prostate gland. It's going to be much smaller than this. It's so it's surrounding the neck of the urinary bladder as well as the proximal portion of the urethra. Urethra will then be traveling through the muscles that will be forming the floor of the pelvis. So we call this part the membranous or intermediate urethra. Next part is going to be the part of the urethra that will be traveling through the penis. So we're having here, we're looking at a sagittal section of the penis. As we're going to learn later on in the reproductive system, we have three main parts of the penis, the root, the shaft, and glands. The urethra here is traveling through the lower part of the penis. If we are looking at a transverse section of the penis, this is how it's going to look like. All right, so here we go. All right, so this is how it's going to look like in a transverse section. We've got two erectile tubes. 
located on the dorsal side of the penis, the upper part. So those are called the corpora cavernosa. The single noun is gonna be corpus cavernosa. And on the ventral surface, the lower part of the penis, we're gonna have another erectile tube. This is called the corpus spongiosa. Spongiosum, it's like sponge. It's like a sponge, it's compressible. And this is where the u the urethra is going to be troubled. This is the urethra on the inside. So we call this part of the urethra that will be traveling in the penis is either penile urethra or spongy urethra. So we give it, it has two names, either penile urethra because it travels in the penis or spongy urethra as it travels in the corpus spongiosum of the penis. All right, so again, again, for the male urethra, it's much longer. It's gonna be around 20 centimeters in length. So what do you think? Who's gonna be more likely to develop a UTI, a urinary tract infection, males or females? What do you think? Females, why? Because in females, I have a very short urethra. So it's gonna be easier for the bacteria to climb causing a UTI in females compared to traveling all this distance, 20 centimeters. All right, so that's why females are more likely to develop UTIs compared to males. So we're looking here at the urethra. So again, this is another five stars diagram. All the markings are, are, are gonna be highly important for us. We've seen the peritoneum, which is the covering on the outside the muscle on the inside for in the wall of the urinary bladder this is going to be the true detrusor muscle on the inside we've got those ridges those elevations in the mucosa lining of the urinary bladder this is those are the rugae we can see the openings here of the ureters those are the ureteric orifices We've got the triangular shaped part. This is the trigone. The most common wrong answer for trigone is the neck of the urinary bladder. Neck of the bladder is on the outside. What we're looking at on the inside, this triangular shape, this funnel shaped part that will be conducting the urine towards the urethra. This is called the trigone not the neck of the bladder. It's not the neck of the bladder. This is the most common wrong answer for, tri for the trigone. Kept moving down, we're gonna be traveling through the urethra and the part of the urethra surrounded by the prostate gland. This is gonna be the prosthetic urethra. Then we're gonna have the part that will be traveling through the muscles of the pelvic floor, the urogenital diaphragm. This is gonna be the intermediate urethra or the membranous urethra. A third part of the urethra is gonna be the part of the urethra that travels through the length of the penis. We call this is the spongy urethra or the penile urethra. 
Again, the opening of the urethra to the outside. This is going to be the external urethral orifice. External urethra, urethral orifice. Questions? Questions? All right, moving on to micturation. So how micturation takes place? First triggering factor here for micturation is going to be the stretch applied by the urine to the wall of the urinary blood. This is going to be sensed and the signal is going to be conducted to the nervous system and the part of the nervous system that's going to be responsible to respond is going to be the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is going to be sending out its signals to the urinary bladder to be more specific, the detrusor muscle of the urinary bladder. And to the internal urethral sphincter. So I'm sending out the signals to both the detrusor muscle of the urinary bladder and to the internal urethral sphincter. So what's going to happen? The muscle here would respond by contracting. Would you like to contract or to relax the internal urethral sphincter? What do you think? Would you like to contract or to relax to allow micturation to take place? Would you like to contract or to relax the internal urethral sphincter? Relax. Relax. What do you think? Relax. So, how come the same signal affecting smooth muscles going to have two different responses? Detrusor muscle contracting and internal urethral sphincter relaxing. Is this something logical? What do you think? I'm sending the same exact signal to two smooth muscles. You want one of them to contract and you want the other to relax. Is this something logical? Actually, the internal urethral sphincter is going to be contracting in response to the parasympathetic innervation. But you see on here, this is how it's going to look like. Internal urethral sphincter looks like this. So normally, it's closed when it's relaxed. When it contracts, Now it opens. So the internal urethral sphincter, does it contract or relax for micturation to take place? It contracts. And when it contracts, it opens. So normally it's relaxed. It doesn't perform a muscle contraction to hold the urine inside the urinary blood. But when you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, you fill the urinary bladder. Now, 
the muscle will contract and when it contracts it opens does this make sense all right so again again internal urethral sphincter does it contract or relax to allow maturation to take place it contracts and when it contracts it opens so you're going to be sending the same exact signal to both the detrusor muscle to contract and to the internal urethral sphincter also to contract and when it contracts it opens all right so now a person feels the urge to make curate and if it's not a suitable time what would i do i will be contracting the external urethral sphincter which is under voluntary control so now i pay attention that i need to hold the urine right only when the internal urethral sphincter contracts and opens when it contracts to open i now feel the urge that i want to go to the restroom so what would i do to hold the urine i contract my external urethral sphincter when it's suitable what you're going to need to do to the external urethral sphincter is you relax it so normally it's relaxed it's open so if i'm not activating the parasympathetic nervous system external urethral sphincter is open and the internal urethral sphincter is the one that is closed when i activate the parasympathetic nervous system remember internal urethral sphincter opens but this doesn't mean that it's going to be relaxing it's going to be contracting to open but for me to hold the urine what will i do i need to contract my external urethral sphincter so how come this one when it contracts it closes and this one when it contracts it opens how the fibers are arranged so internal urethral sphincter you're going to have fibers radiating like this so when it contracts it opens compared to the external urethral sphincter you're going to have circular muscles so when it contracts it closes the muscle fibers are circular so when it contracts it closes the sphincter all right so again again what are the three steps of make curation first is going to be the contraction of the detrusor muscle then the contraction of the internal urethral sphincter and finally the voluntary part is going to be the relaxation of the external urethral sphincter questions questions all right so moving on to the chemical composition of the urine the urine is going to be formed 95 percent of it is water and five percent is going to be solutes nitrogenous waste like the urea uric acid creatinine also is going to be part of the solute content of the urine as well as normal solutes like the sodium potassium calcium magnesium bicarb all those are normal solutes that i have in my system but i get them released out in the urine to regulate their 
concentration in my breath. Abnormally high concentration of those constituents of the urine may indicate a pathology. So for example, if I have high calcium in the urine, this might be a marker for hypersecretion of a hormone called PTH or parathyroid hormone. So I've seen large amounts of calcium out of the urine. This tells me that you've got something wrong with the PTH. Uh, I see glucose out in the urine. This means I've got something wrong with my blood sugar levels and so on. So high concentration of any of the constituents of the urine will be reflecting a, an underlying pathology. Moving on to the homeostatic imbalances related to the urinary system first is gonna be the chronic renal disease. Chronic renal disease is diagnosed if a person has a GFR less than 60 milliliters per minute. Can you remind me what was the normal GFR? Can you remind me, please, what was the normal GFR, the normal glomerular filtration rate? 160, 12 hours, normal GFR, 60, 24, Don't remember even where was this slide. Here we go. Normal GFR. Again, what is the normal GFR? Can you see it? 120 to 25. 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. So again, again, what is the normal GFR? 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. So if it drops by half, so this means have the normal. So I go all the way down to 60 milliliters. I, my kidney is performing lower than half what it's normally gonna be filtering. So we consider this as chronic renal disease. In chronic renal disease, I have nitrogenous waste which, which are accumulating in the blood. This is going to lead to accumulation of lots of acids. This puts a person at risk of developing acidosis or acidemia. I'm accumulating acids in my system, disturbing the blood pH. Leading causes for chronic renal disease are two of the most common chronic homeostatic imbalances that we see in the community. Those are diabetes and hypertension. Diabetes and hypertension can result in chronic renal disease. That's why if a patient was diagnosed with diabetes, the physician or the nurse will ask him to come every six months to perform a renal function test. But why? We want to make sure that his kidneys are working fine. Also, one of the other things that diabetic patients need to go and check is going to be check their eyes. All right, fundal exam. So I need to check the fundus for any uh, disturbance in the amount of blood reaching the retina, because one of the most important complications for diabetic patients would be chronic renal disease and blindness. 
Moving on to another homeostatic imbalance. Why this happens? Why diabetes can cause retinopathy and macular degeneration? Is this your question? And chronic renal disease? Diabetes is associated with something that we call end arthritis. obliterans. So what do you understand from the name on here? That I have obliteration, it's completely blocked. Arthritis means inflammation in the arteries. Which arteries? The end arteries. The end arteries means the arterioles that are going directly to the capillary bed. So what happens here, due to the irritation of the endothelium in diabetic patients. Diabetic patients and arteries will have recurrent inflammation that will be healing by fibrosis. So the arteries will be obliterated or blocked. So if the arteries are blocked, afferent arterioles, for example, in the glomerulus. So here we're looking at the glomerulus. And this was the afferent arteriole. This is my Bowman's capsule. If my afferent arteriole is affected and this causes the obliteration of the afferent arteriole, would there be any blood that would be capable to filter to get filtered here through this glomerulus. If this glomerulus is not, in, is not getting enough blood. Same concept with the retina. The retina, if you remember, is located within the eye as the deepest layer. Remember, we have the sclera on the outside. Underneath the sclera, we've got the vascular layer, which includes the iris, ciliary body, and the choroid. And to the inside of all this, we've got the retina. And the part that you see best with, the part that you can focus the pictures on is called the macula lutea and it has a central part called the fovea centralis and this is going to need a large amount of blood supply because it's rich in photoreceptors like 50% of its photoreceptors are cones which can see in bright light, colored vision, high acuity colored vision, and the other 50% are rods, which will be responsible to see in dim light. Compared to the rest of the retina, it has much less cones. So this part of the retina is rich in cones, so it needs more blood supply for it to function. So what happens to those photoreceptors if I don't have enough blood supply because I have diabetes and again, those are end arteries that will become obliterated. So they are completely blocked. If I have obliteration of the retinal arteries here, what's gonna happen? The retina will start to degenerate and we call this disease in here, it's the macular degeneration. And this will be the most common reason for blindness in elderly patients, especially ones with hypertension and diabetes. All right, did this answer your question? All right, great. So moving on to another homeostatic imbalance related to the kidney, also, this is gonna be renal failure. 
renal failure is diagnosed if I have a GFR that dropped below 15 milliliters per minute. Again, what was the normal? Normal GFR is 120 to 20, 125, right? So less than 15 means I'm getting closer to 10% of the normal GFR. So if you dropped 50%, this is considered a chronic renal disease. If I have a drop of almost 90% of the normal GFR, this is renal failure. The filtration almost stops in this kidney. There is no sufficient filtration that is taking place for me to get rid of the wastes. So the waste will start to build up in the blood and the blood pH will be imbalanced. The only two options here for those patients with renal failure will be dialysis and, or kidney transplant. So what we're gonna simply do, we're gonna put the patient on dialysis until he finds a donor or until he his turn to receive a kidney transplant gets closer, right? So until he moves on the transplant list up to get his kidney transplant, he needs to be put on a dialysis. And dialysis is so simple. We're gonna be pulling the blood out we run the blood through membranes, like filters. The same concept like what we do here in the glomerulus. And we're gonna return this blood back. This puts the patient at many risks, like developing of uh, blood clots, and even we'll see patients with very coarse veins in their arms. Those are the dialysis patients. Why? Because simply the blood, when it moves back in, in order to move, we push it at a higher pressure than normally present in the veins. So this will cause the dilation of the veins and the development of varicose veins, although those are in the upper lobes. So I got a question here, will the same problem reoccur if they get a transplant but still have the underlying diseases? Yes. So actually in order to be on the list for to get a transplant, you need to, the, the, you are gonna be, a person gonna be required, the patient gonna be required to maintain his blood sugar level. Uh, at normal levels to keep uh, his blood pressure at normal levels. All right, so you can't even get a kidney transplanted if you do not. So it's the same like if a person requires a lung transplant and this patient was a smoker. So you do not actually put the patient on the list to get a lung transplant unless he stops smoking for a certain time. I'm not exactly sure of the regulations, but what I what I know that although diabetes and hypertension are not curable, so you don't cure them, but I need to maintain normal blood glucose levels for a certain period before getting the transplant. And actually diabetes and hypertension are risky in terms of getting any surgery done, all right? So patient needs to make sure that he has normal blood sugar, normal blood pressure before even get the transplant. All right.
what is the success rate of an older person who has renal failure and they need a kidney transplant? So generally speaking, let me double check here. So official statistics here, broadly speaking, not age related, success rate for the first month is gonna be 97, means the surgery has nothing wrong. 93% will have success Till the end of the year, like one year after surgery, and 83% for three years. All right, but at an older age, getting a kidney transplant, it's all going to be determined according the to what caused the renal failure in the first place. So if this patient has many other problems, the success rate will be much lower than this. All right, we're not talking here about how successful is the surgery, but how successful will the kidney be working for the patient and for how long? So when we check the transplant failure, we say, for example, so success rate is 90% for how long? For one year, for three years, for five years, and so on. And something also that we need to put into consideration whether the patient will tolerate uh, the medications that we give them in order for the body to not reject the transplanted organ. Because Patients will need to be on corticosteroids for long, for a long time. So this can reduce their immune system ability to fight against infection. So the person might even get a disease not related to the kidney, but because of the medication he's taken for his body to not reject the transplanted kidney. All right, I have no clue, Rachel, for how long or the regulations of the, of the medication. But I, uh, I can look this up, but I'm not sure if it's gonna be, it's gonna be much more complicated than this, because it's according to how compatible was the kidney that was given to the patient, how compatible was it for the patient. So I'm not sure exactly uh, but it's get there will be other determining factors that will be determining for how long would the patient be taking medications for to prevent the, re, the rejection i need to check this i'm not sure all right questions questions All right, moving on to another homeostatic imbalance that would be related to the urinary system. This is gonna be the incontinence. And incontinence, simply speaking, it's gonna be an uncontrollable urine dribbling or voiding. We have stress incontinence. This is gonna be triggered by coughing, laughing, or pregnancy. Overfill incontinence, is only when the bladder is overfilled. 
So stress incontinence, what happens in here? What's common in coughing, laughing, and pregnancy? What's common in all those three? I have an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. And when I have an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure, this compresses the urinary bladder, causing the uncontrollable dripping of the urine. Overfill incontinence. So what if it's not suitable to go to the restroom right now? What would I do? So the detrusor muscle is contracting. The internal urethral sphincter did contract and as a result, it opens. All right. And it's not suitable to go to the restroom at this point. So what will I do? I will be contracting the external urethra center. So what can I be, can I hold the urine forever? Can I hold the urine forever? No, why? Because those are skeletal muscles. They are more fatigable. And the pressure here inside the urinary bladder at a certain point will exceed the pressure created by the external urethral sphincter contraction. So at this point, what's gonna happen? Uncontrolled, uncontrollable ur urine dribbling or voiding, overfill incontinence. Renal calculi or re kidney stones, the First place where kidney stones going to be formed is going to be the renal pelvis. This is where the crystallization of calcium, magnesium, uric acid will first take place. Large stones can block the ureters and cause pressure and pain in the kidney. This might be due to bacterial infection, urine retention, increase in the calcium levels in the blood, or increase in the urine pH. So all those are risk factors for developing of renal calculi or kidney stones. So there is a famous triad on here. Retention. infections and stones. So if a person developed one of them, he will automatically develop the others. So if I have urine retention, who will love to grow in a place without flow? just water and this water is not moving. So this is gonna be the bacteria. So the bacteria will start to grow, causing infections. And the stagnation of the fluid also will allow the solutes in the urine to start to deposit forming stones. If a person got stones, this is going to be blocking the urine pathway, causing retention that will end up causing infections. If a person got an infection, inflammation will be disturbing the flow of the urine and will result also in development of kidney stones. So if a person has one, the other two would be resulting 
from it. So if a person starts by having a UTI, he will get urine retention and it might progress also to development of kidney stones. If a person has kidney stones, it might also cause kidney infections, urinary tract infections, and so on. So if you got one, you are at risk of developing the other two. All right, so looking at this diagram, this is a highly important diagram showing the histological picture of the nephron. So what we're looking at in here, looking at this stuff of capillaries. This is my glomerulus. And the glomerulus, if you see on here, it's surrounded by this cup-shaped structure. This is going to be my glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule, this space on here. All together, all together, this is going to be the renal corpuscle. So the renal corpuscle is both the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. Both of them together is called the renal corpuscle. You can see here the kidney tubules. So this is one on here. If you notice, this one has a clear lumen compared to this one on here. The lumen is not clear, it has a fuzzy lumen. So which one is the proximal convoluted tubule? Which one is the distal convoluted tubule? Can you remind me which one is going to be responsible for most of the reabsorption? Most of the reabsorption going to be taking place where? Proximal or distal? You remember? Where do you put the, when would you deposit your check? Early or late? Proximal or distal? Would you be performing most of the reabsorption? Proximal, proximal convoluted tubules. And remember, what allowed the proximal convoluted tubules to perform most of the reabsorption is the presence of microvilli. And those microvilli on here is what will appear as a fuzzy lumen. So what do I see on here? What kind of kidney tubules are those ones? Those are my proximal convoluted tubules. Compared to the ones with clear lumens, the ones with clear lumen, those are my distal convoluted tubules. Remember why? Because the cells didn't have dense microvilli. They have less microvilli. They have less microvilli, so the lumens will be clear. All right. Questions, questions. Any questions? All right, so just a quick reminder. We have our lab exam lecture exam and chapters 18 and 19 quizzes do do today tonight 
All right, so by midnight tonight, lecture, lab exam, and the chapters 18 and 19 quizzes, you're going to be closed. So you won't be able to access them after midnight. All right. Don't start a test few minutes before its due date because due date means the test is closed. So if you are taking the test at 11.55, you're gonna get into the test, it will be closed in five minutes. All right, so please make sure that you at least take the test at least two, three hours before the due date. All right, because if you try to access it just two minutes before the due date, it won't let you in even. Again, lab exam is conducted through smarter proctoring, which you can find on here, smarter proctoring. Check smarter proctoring, you scroll down. You need to be using Google Chrome, of course. Scroll down, you can take the test, cardiovascular system lab exam. Any questions concerning the exams, lab, lecture, anything? All right, so I don't wanna start a new chapter today. I just wanna make sure to give you time to get the cardiovascular system material done. And if you're still didn't complete any of the cardiovascular assignments, please get them completed before midnight so you still have uh, five and a half hours remaining to get everything completed. All right, so this completes our discussion for tonight. No, there was no in-class activity today. There was no in-class activity today. All right, so this completes our discussion for tonight. Can you show all the five stars slides? Yes. So all the diagrams, all the diagrams for the urinary system lab exam are gonna be retrieved from this chapter, chapter 25, not chapter 26. Chapter 26 is gonna be dealing with more physiology than anatomy. So we don't have major diagrams in 26 that we gonna be concerned with in terms of lab exam. So most of the lab exam is gonna be, in terms of diagrams, is gonna be from chapter 25, but don't forget we have one essay question that we discussed half of it last class and the other half will be discussed next class. So we've got one essay question, 15 points out of 50. We have the 35 points that will be towards the identification with questions, which are diagram based. I will be rating the diagrams for you here. So first, the diagram showing the organs that will be sharing in the formation of the urinary system. This is gonna be a four stars diagram. It's of high importance to be able to identify the inferior vena cava, abdominal aorta, renal artery vein, in urinary bladder, rectum, urine, and so on. Kidneys, of course, adrenal glands. A three stars diagram showing a transverse section of the abdominal cavity. Please note that the abdominal cavity is different than the peritoneal cavity. Peritoneal cavity is a part of the abdominal cavity, but doesn't mean it's the abdominal cavity. So we're looking here, 
peritoneal cavity. And behind the peritoneal cavity, we can see the kidneys, the major blood vessels coming, moving up and down behind the peritoneal cavity. Moving on here, a transverse section of the kidney showing the renal cortex, renal medulla, the renal pyramids, the papillae, the minor calluses, major calluses, the renal pelvis, the ureter, the renal columns, all those are gonna be of great importance. This is a highly important diagram. It's a five stars diagram. Another highly important diagram, a five stars diagram, is a diagram showing the basic structure of the nephron, the different parts of the kidney tubules, as well as the glomerulus with the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteries. Another five stars diagram. It's going to be showing the two different types of nephrons, cortical nephrons on the left and the juxtamedullary nephrons on the right side of the diagram. Also, it's very important to differentiate between the different types of capillaries. So we've got here the top of capillaries located inside the bomus capsule. This is the glomerulus. We've got the capillaries around the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. Those are my peritubular capillaries. We've got the capillaries around the long loops of Henle. Those are my vasa recta. Also very important to differentiate between the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole and the key here for you to know which one is the afferent arteriole and which one is the efferent. The one that is connected to the peritubular capillaries as you see on here, this is the efferent arteriole, the one that is coming from the renal arteries, this is gonna be the afferent arteriole. So, Make sure you can differentiate here between the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole. If I'm a branch of an artery, I am an efferent arteriole. If I am carrying the blood due to the peritubular capillaries, this is going to be an efferent arteriole. So again, again, this is a five stars diagram. A two stars diagram that is not showing much on here, which will be the diagram showing the three steps of the urine formation. This is a three stars diagram, or just if you've seen it, if you've seen it, this is gonna be, uh, if you've seen it on the test, mainly I will be asking you about the three steps of the urine formation. Next are gonna be the, on here. Five stars diagram is showing the urinary bladder and the urethra, female urethra. Every single marking on the diagram is highly important, very important. Another five stars diagram showing the difference between the male urethra and the female urethra. Also, you can see many markings are repeated from the previous diagram of the urinary bladder. Another five stars diagram is showing the microscopic picture of the nephrons. Very important to Identify the glomerulus, sebomus capsule, proximal, and distal convoluted tubules on the slide.